Well, uh, thank you very much for taking your time to assist uh, to this presentation. So my name is uh, Clara Canovas and I work for the Mobley's Wolf Shark uh, Research uh, Program. So just to give you a bit of my background, I studied environmental sciences in Spain. I'm originally from Spain, from an island uh, called Mallorca. So I, started, I studied environmental sciences, did my master's in marine ecology. I did work for a bit in, in national parks and sustainable fisheries management, as well as as an environmental uh, guide. And then in 2016, I joined the Maldives World Shark Research Program as a volunteer. So ever since then, I've been working and been involved in the project. Unfortunately, due to uh, the pandemic, we had to cease operations in 2020. Um, normally, we are six uh, staff members working for the organization, but currently we are half the team on a part-time basis. So two of my colleagues are in field uh, currently and I am based in, in Spain right now. So hopefully when the situation improves, I'll be able uh, to join the Maldives again. <laughs> So the Maldives World Shark Research Program is a dual UK and Maldivian uh, registered charity. So it's a research-based conservation charity which studies uh, whale sharks. So we seek to advance in the field of whale shark uh, knowledge and to advocate for sound conservation policy in the Maldives. So here you would have a uh, whale shark. So the scientific name is called uh, Rincodon typus. So this whale shark here is specifically called Duncan. So whale sharks have individual spot patterns and uh, we have a database specifically for the Maldives. So this is specifically a whale shark called Duncan WS036. The, the database has currently over 530 individuals. Just to make sure, I don't know if someone's got their microphone on. Could it be possible? <laughs> yes, Clara. Okay, I, I serious. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but you can all well, still hear me, fine. right? Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So uh, the wall shark is, uh, is yes, the yes, can hear you. Yeah, perfect. So the wall shark is the largest extant fish in the ocean, but still there's significant gaps in our understanding of its behavior and ecology. So from what you, what you can see, there's characteristic body markings, there's two forms of, of camouflage. We would have the spots and stripes, would be the, the disruptive uh, coloration. And then we would see in the ventral surface, it's a lighter color, and this is called counter shading. And then where the two shades would meet, it's called the counter shade border. So this is used for camouflage as a defensive manner, and it's very important during their early stages of, of life to hide from predators. So I, I've labeled here, we would have the, the first uh, dorsal fin, which is the largest fin on the back of a shark. Then it's got a, a second dorsal fin. It functions to aid stability, may have a role in thermal regulation. Fins are rigid and elongated and it helps the individual move swiftly and with agility. Uh, then we would have the back fin, uh, the tail fin called the caudal fin. It's comprised of two lobes. As you can see, there's the upper lobe is, is much larger and then we would have the lower lobe which is much smaller. Um, so this type is called uh, heterocelco fin. They're asymmetrical uh, lobes. Then we would have the, the huge pectoral fins, which project uh, horizontally from each side of the shark. Um, the role for these pectoral fins was, would be to maintain the shark's position in the water column. It would assist in an energy efficient glide. Then we would have the pelvic fins, which are the pair of small fins on the underside of the shark, which is located either side of the pleocal opening. And it's directly opposite to the first uh, dorsal fin. Then the cloacal opening, which is uh, located between the pelvic fins, this is an opening for reproductive purposes and the female whale sharks, as well as for waste uh, excretion. Okay, so then we have a very little, little eye, which represents like 1% of its total length located on the anterior lateral uh, corner. What this makes is that it increases the risk of injury to the eyes as they're located over there. Okay, so 
as whale sharks have very small eyes, we do think that whale sharks depend little on vision compared to other senses like olfaction, so smelling. Um, they could track uh, swimmers from three to five meters uh, distance, playing an important role in, in short range perception. And something that I'll discuss uh, in the following slides, these eyes are covered by dermal denticles. So uh, I'll give a bit more explanation of what this is, but this is pro providing them a, a protective layer. They also have a strong ability to retract their eyeball as, uh, into the eye socket. So cerebellum, they, they have a highly foliated cerebellum, one of the largest cerebellums within the chondrichthyon clade. That's, this is two traits that are shared um, with thresher sharks as well as with basking sharks. And high levels of foliation in cartilaginous fishes have been linked uh, to agile prey capture, habitat high dimensionality, ability to perform multifaceted tasks, and then uh, this is a specific study done that uh, scans of neonate specimens of Ricodon typus demonstrated that corpus foliation appeared in early stages of development. Uh, ears. So whale sharks are very big individuals and it is thought that the inner ear of the species is the largest in, known in the animal kingdom. It may be simply because of the large size of the individual Okay, but it suggests that the other auditory structures may be proportional uh, to. Then we would have the gills. Wall sharks have five pairs of gill slits, eight for respiration, okay, as well as for feeding purposes. Then we would have a large terminal mouth. Do wall sharks have teeth? Yes, they do. This is something I'll discuss further too. And then we would have the, the spiracles uh, close to the eyes. The spiracles are an effective, another uh, gill opening used to aid in respiration in shark and ray species, which do spend time uh, stationary on the bottom. And then how large a role they play in wall sharks is, is debatable. Then you'd see that there's like some lines going across the, the wall shark. These are called uh, longitudinal ridges. So there's seven uh, ridges on its sides, which this which is forming is a, a six uh, fluid flow channels over its body, skin surface, and this would modify its hydrodynamic characteristics. So whale sharks are they fish? Yes, whale sharks are fish. Fortunately, many people <laughs> think they aren't. They say they are whales, but yes, they are fish. There's over 33,000 uh, species of fish in the rivers uh, in world's rivers, lakes, and oceans. About 1,100 would be cartilaginous fish. The rest would be bony fish. So they are fish, they are cartilaginous, elasmobranchs. So cartilaginous, we would have two subclasses. We have the elasmobranchs, and then we would have the olothephaly, the chimeras. Okay, so characteristic is that their skeleton is made out of, of cartilage. This allows us to stay afloat, swim long distances and it requires less, less energy for them. And elasmobranch would be the word for, so elasmobranch in, in Latin would mean plated gills. Okay, so the gills, as mentioned earlier, extract the, ocean, uh, the oxygen from the seawater. Um, over here in this picture, we would have the old uh, <laughs> grandpa, great grandpa of, of the whale sharks. So uh, a cladocelic, a 370 million year old individual. So cartilaginous fish have been around for 450 million years. And the sharks first appeared in the fossil record 370 million uh, years ago. Okay. Um, there was uh, over a hundred specimens of cladocelics found in North America in Lake Erie. And these were very well preserved. So you could see the jaw, the crania, the vertebrae, muscle fibers, and even kidney tubules. But not in all specimens, but of some of them, they were. So if you want, if, if you compare with the body plan of the actual whale shark, it has remained largely unchanged. Sharks were in the oceans before the dinosaurs arrived on Earth and are still here today, 60 million years uh, later. So obviously, they have been doing something right up until now. And it's relatively a very new species. It is thought to be around uh, 60 million um, years. Okay, the, the first evolved 60 million years ago. 
we have some interesting facts regarding whale sharks. So the first time a whale shark was scientifically uh, recorded was in South Africa in 1828 in Table, Table Bay by a surgeon from the British uh, troops. Whale sharks have a single global distribution from the tropics of Cancer to the tropics of Capricorn and it's, it's found in tropical waters and tem warm temperate uh, seas. So by 1985, so over 150 years after it was first scientifically recorded, there were only 320 records of this species. So as there's um, a global database called the Wild Book for Whale Sharks, they have whale shark encounters from over 50 different countries. And I think they've got over 13,000 individuals, locked individuals, and more than 34, uh, 74,000 uh, logged encounters, which is, which is pretty amazing. There's, it is thought that there's roughly around 25 hotspots um, throughout the world. So we have cases like Philippines, Mozambique, Mexico, Western Australia, St. Helena, and Djibouti. So they are not regarded as social animals, but they do respond to regular seasonally driven uh, planktonic food sources. So there's when there's local blooms or spawning of fishes and corals, then you do see massive aggregations. I've, I haven't traveled much to see whale sharks in other places in the world, unfortunately, uh, but I visited St. Helena in, in the Atlantic Ocean and just in one single encounter, we had over 40 individuals, but I know of other colleagues and they've, they've been, or they, they know of um, encounters of over 400 wolf sharks on the surface. So, yeah, so not social, but they do gather when there's, there's food available. Um, the longest distance traveled by, or well, the longest distance uh, tracked from a whale shark um, was a whale shark which was tagged at Coiba Island in Panama. It traveled over 20,000 kilometers from the tropical eastern Pacific uh, Panama to the western Indo-Pacific in the Mariana Trench. So in 841 days. Then another whale shark, for example, as a local example for you in Gujarat uh, coast, there was a whale shark which covered a distance of about 5,500 kilometer over a, a total of 200 tracking uh, days. So it moved from Sutrapada <laughs> towards the coast of Somalia. Okay, and it seems like it was circling back to, to Gujarat. Um, okay. Then over here, I'm, I'm gonna specifically uh, discuss some of, the, some of the characteristics of the population we have in the Maldives. Okay, so uh, over here, we have the largest marine protected area in the Maldives, it's called Safari marine protected area. It was uh, first declared in, in, in 2009. Uh, there are a set of regulations uh, put in place. So there's a speed limitation of 10 knots, maximum of 80 people in the water, five boats per encounter. But unfortunately, uh, it isn't being enforced. They did introduce rangers in the area, but unfortunately they were only present for a short period of time and then then COVID struck. So uh, hopefully uh, by this year or the following year, the rangers will be back in, in the water. Um, uh, in the meantime, also the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency, and as well as the IUCN uh, held different uh, stakeholder meetings and they are planning to release a draft management plan soon. So from this map, you'll see Digura. This is the island where we've been based for the last year. So if we started uh, in 2006 as a research organization. We were doing short um, scientific expeditions. Then we were based at a resort and then we moved uh, to a local island. This year, unfortunately, uh, due to COVID restrictions, we are only going to organize six research trips on a six two week research trips on a, on a liveaboard and then perhaps on 2022, when the situation improves, we'll be able to, to move back to Digura and, or, and also visit other local islands. Something which is very interesting about Saudari Marine Protected Area. So over here, you will have an aerial footage of Digura. So Digura is, so outside the harbor of Digura, you have the, the start of, of the Marine Protected Area. 
So something which is very interesting of the area is you, you have a, a high presence of immature males. So this not only happens in the Maldives, there's other regions too. And so normally on coastal aggregations, you have uh, small immature males between three to six, seven meters in length. This is yeah, the highest percentage uh, of what is observed in coastal aggregations. There's very, very few areas where females are sighted. So mature males over, I would say 90% is currently the, the latest statistical result we have. So over 90% are males. I've seen very, very few females. What we have next to South Arima in protected area, it's very deep water. So what we're thinking is that the whale sharks are mostly feeding in deeper waters and then coming to the surface to thermoregulate. So they are cold blooded animals and they need to recover. Okay, so they do spend a lot of time at the surface in South Ari, which also makes them very vulnerable because of the high numbers in tourism in the area. Some of the uh, findings, the most recent findings. So in the Maldives, there are 72% of the, of the whale sharks in the database are males. It is true that we have a very different uh, condition in the southern areas of the Maldives in the deep south where most of the encounters are females. And in this case, they are large females, so mature individuals. Yeah, there's other places in the world where you would also find mature individuals, for example, St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. You have, which is very interesting, 50% females, 50% males could be a mating ground. That's something that scientists are currently researching. In Galapagos Island, over 98% of the sighted individuals are females too, mature females. So they've been carrying ultrasound tests as well as uh, blood tests to see the status of, of the females. And then the average size for uh, South Ari Marine Protected Area would be 5.78 meters. So this is still a teenager. Last year, we had 80 different individuals observed, which is a lot considering that we were only in field for a period of two months because we had to shut our operations, as I, as I mentioned, and 43 individuals were new to the database. Most of this data we have from last year is coming from contributors to the citizen science platform we have, so I'll further discuss this. In, in a while. Then most of the submissions from the south were female whale sharks. And we have a, a whale shark named our, our, after our captain's grandson called Chaiban. It was seen 26 times in 2012, in 2000, 2000, 2020, last year. So the first time Chaiban encountered a whale shark, I remember he said it was his best day ever. <laughs> so that's yeah, it's a very sweet, very sweet. So how big can whale sharks get? So there's credible estimations of 18 to 20 meters. The largest dead recorded specimen was 12.6 meters. Okay, so when whale sharks die, the carcass normally sinks. So it's very difficult to, to see whale sharks being washed up in the shore. And credible estimations. So why do we think they're credible estimations? Most of the times it's fishermen fishermen know how long their boat is and then they have the individual next to their boat and they would sort of say okay my boat is 15 meters it was slightly bigger than 15 meters so then 17 18. the largest shark i've ever seen in the maldives in south Arian marine protected area was 7.5 meters no long not no bigger than that how deep can they get they can get uh, they can dive down to almost 2000 meters we do think they could go beyond the 2,000 and even reach the 3,000. But unfortunately, the tags, <laughs> they need to be improved because normally they would crush because of the pressure and, and stop working. But in St. Helena, they, in 2019, they specialized. They, they deployed specialized deep tags for, for this purpose. So how fast do they grow? in the first year 0 0.40 meters and then then it would go up to 0 0.26 meters by by year 20. 
projected life expectancy. So this is an aging growth curve uh, done by one of our scientific advisors. Uh, he was also one of the infield uh, team members. So he estimated that the projected um, life expectancy was uh, 130 years and the sexual maturity to be 20, between 23 and 28 years. So roughly 25 years, of course, all of this is estimations. So do all sharks have teeth? Sorry. <laughs> People are, when they get in the water, when we have, when we see guests in the water and, you know, tourists around, they're like, oh, what if the whale shark eats me? They have a very big mouth. Do they have teeth? And then you're like, yeah, they do. And they, they, they all sort of panic, but they have very, very small teeth, about two millimeters long. They have to up to 3,000 3, uh, teeth. So what's the function of these teeth? The function is, is unknown but it may help uh, provide grip for the male when mating with the female. This has never been recorded. So this is just something that we're assuming, but most likely this would be one of the reasons. But however, this could also be an evolutionary uh, relic. So the skin, as mentioned previously, is covered with dermal denticles as well as the eyes. This is also called placoid scales. Structurally, these um, dermal denticles are very similar to teeth. Um, they include an inner colophobe, middle layer of, of dentine. And what they're doing is they're creating a, an extremely hydrodynamic uh, surface. So this means minimal drag in the water and, and reduce energy expenditure. At the same time, whale sharks have very thick skin from what you can see in, in this picture. So whale sharks, they are filter feeders. There are three filter feeding uh, sharks and they are the largest of all fishes. So we would have the basking shark, we would have the megamouth and the whale shark. They feed on a variety of planktonic and nectonic organisms. Okay. Um, we do think they have well, well, it is, it has been proved that they have well developed olfactory lobes of the telencephalon, uh, meaning that olfaction might play a major role in foraging behaviors, okay? So we're gonna check on this video, different types of feeding observed. So this is a very passive uh, way of feeding, ram filter feeding. Normally this takes place when the whale shark is cruising at the surface, when there's not much plankton in the water. It's just a very, very lazy way of, of feeding the whale shark would have. And then we would have suction feeding, requires much more energy. If there's a good patch of plankton, then surely it will enjoy its meal. So water flow is generated by the vacuum force of the shark, snapping its mouth open quickly, and then by the shark closing its mouth and forcing the water out of its, of its gills. Okay. So we have several types of behaviors we analyze when we are in the water with an encounter. What we're trying to assess is the changes in behavior uh, which could be affected to anthropogenic impact, could be boat speeding, could be number of people in the water, number of boats, if the code of conduct is breached. So this is cruising. Most encounters in the Gura, like the highest percentage of the encounters are these ones, cruising, cruising sharks, very, very slow. Most of the times they, they are sort of in a lethargic state, like recovering probably from these deep dives. Inquisitive sharks, these are sharks which are uh, most likely new to the area. Probably it's the first time they've encountered humans or one of the first times. They are normally sharks. That when we receive a video from a contributor, from someone involved in citizen science, and they send us a video and we see this behavior. Most of the times it's a new, new arrival to the area, new individual. 
it is difficult to swim away from it because it's it's interested more in, in you than it is on you so it, it's a very very nice encounter but unfortunately these are the most vulnerable individuals because then as you know people come to see a whale shark and whale shark gets closed people want some people want to touch it even though it's it's forbidden but you know they're like impressed of this thing swimming towards them and but yeah, we, we must always remember that we do have to keep the three, four meter distance, no matter what. And then those sharks are also interested like in the propellers and the noises and in bubbles from divers. And then evasive, we are seeing a growth in, in numbers in this type of behavior. Oh, sorry, this is interaction. Just a second, these are just uh, two whale sharks uh encountering each other and they what they do is they sort of circle each other and then they just continue their own path i've only seen this in three occasions in the three years i've been actively in field and then over here we would have the the different type of behaviors which are the ones we don't want to see Okay, there's, there's all this, so evasiveness, when the whale shark turns sort of its back towards you, that's already a sign that the whale shark is uncomfortable in this encounter that is probably, you know, going to make an abrupt turn and start diving off quickly. Then over here we would have eyeball retraction. So when you do get closer than three to four meter distance, then you do see how the whale shark is, you know, rolling its eye back. And this is already a sign that you're probably too close to the individual. And we're going to continue now with the reproductive anatomy of whale sharks. So uh, immature males, these are individuals which are most likely less than 8.5 meters in length, nine meters in length, an approximated individual of less than uh, 25 years. And then we would have a mature individual, which is more than nine meters in length and most likely more than 25 years old. So how do we distinguish if it's a male or a female? So the males have claspers, females do not have claspers, okay, like the little two sausages there. And um, how do we know if it's an immature male or a mature uh, male? So normally, if the claspers do not pass beyond the pelvic fins, then there's an immature male. But if they pass the pelvic fins, then it's a mature male. And here we would have a female. This picture is, is from the Galapagos Islands. So remember the mature females, like a higher percentage of them are sighted in the Galapagos and that's where they're carrying out the ultrasound tests as well as uh, blood tests. So do whale sharks lay eggs? They don't lay eggs, but what happens? How is this process? So whale sharks are ovoviviparous. Okay, so so there's eggs, of course there's eggs, but they hatch inside the female and then they are born alive. So there, there's been several, uh, science, there's a few scientific evidence regarding egg cases, but it took until 1995 when one female was harpooned in Taiwan. She was, well, the individual was 10 point six meters in length, and it's almost the sole source of information for almost everything we know about whale shark uh, reproduction. This individual uh, carried 304 embryos in different development stages, so from egg case bound embryos to free swimming near term uh, animals. Of the 29 embryos saved from this female, they were all from the same uh, male. And the sex ratio was 123 females and 144 males. So, you know, very close. 
And what's suggested is that female whale sharks are able to store sperm after a single mating event and then subsequently fertilize their own eggs as they are produced. This has been seen in other species too, like long-term term sperm storage, so that, such as blue, blue sharks. So of course, there's still a lot of unknowns with whale sharks. Where and when do they breed? What is the age of sexual maturity? How often do they breed? All these makes this species very unique because there's still, we don't know. And do they have predators? Yes, they do. Specifically in the Maldives, uh, predators for whale sharks would be for large individuals, for, for mature individuals, um, perhaps killer whales, perhaps tiger sharks, like a, such as in this picture here, we have an individual with a bite mark, most likely from a tiger shark. And its name is Connie, which is bite. <laughs> and then for small size, smaller sized individuals, for immature individuals, they, they have seen, um, there's been presence of, of whale sharks in stomach contents of blue sharks, as well as marlins. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing an increase in anthropogenic impact caused by boat strikes in the Maldives. All of these pictures are specifically in the Maldives. As I've explained, most of the times in Sampa, these sharks are swimming at the surface between the zero to 10 uh, meter region. And it is just a very easy target because it's slow moving, defenseless. So as mentioned, it's a, there's a regulation of, of 10 knots, but Southern Marine Protected Area, it's a 42 square kilometer marine protected area. And you re, you, it, it receives visitors from all the other atolls, um, neighboring atolls, but there's some resorts which would organize excursions and they drive for maybe two hours with a speedboat. And then once they reach the marine protected area, and then it has to start patrolling the area, the 42 square kilometers. Most of the times, depending on the monsoon season, we sort of know everyone has, has the knowledge of where they would be situated. But it is still very difficult um, for speedboats to reduce the speed limit. There's a lot of pressure by guests too. Some guests are paying over $4,000, US dollars to view a whale shark. Others flying into the country and get a private like private jet and then so there's a lot which could be improved but yeah currently it's in the works so Maldives has become the aggregation with the highest percentage of injured uh, individuals and generally we would have all these lacerations amputations so the residents so this this year there's been between uh, 2020 and, and the early start of 2021 uh, three specific scientific papers have come out regarding whale shark injuries, specifically mentioned in South Area Marine Protected Area. So we're seeing that residents are presenting more injuries. 66% of them had an injury from some sort. Abrasions and lacerations were the most common type of injury. So this really What's like, could this affect a whale shark in some sort? Because it seems like they're staying longer. Because from, from the data which has been analyzed, injured individuals are staying longer in South Area Marine Protected Area instead of embarking into a trip and going to another, another atoll. So, most likely, this is causing them stress, could lead to an infection, influence on long term fitness, reproduction, feeding efficiency, as well as survival. Um, specifically from these pictures here at the bottom, we're seeing injury recovery rate. So all wounds of whale sharks reached a point of 90% surface area co uh, closure by day 35. What about bycatch? Um, luckily, in the Maldives, net fishing is banned. Only fishing for bait fish is allowed. The rest of the arts which involve uh, nets is forbidden. So these are just examples on, of, of purse signers. Though very rarely registered, they are there are accidental captures. Uh, in some cases, the, 
the whale sharks used to, well, they act as fish aggregating devices. And then industrial fishers, what they do is they search for the presence of whale sharks and other megafauna as cues to locate species, for example, as tuna. But there's been an imposed uh, moratorium on the international net settling setting on, on whale sharks. So what about whale sharks and once they're captured, what is done with them? So unfortunately, most fisheries take place on an unregulated uh, black market basis from you can see in, the, in these pictures. Despite banning, some countries are huge, there are extensive areas and their seas are very difficult to police or if not, they would capture an individual and then travel to international waters. The total factory value for an individual specimen could be up to 30,000 uh, per, per animal. Um, there was a three year investigation for a specific factory in, in southeastern Asia, uh, in southeastern uh, China, for example, and this in this single factory, they were processing over 600 individuals per year, which is a lot. Just if you think about it, the database from the Maldives five, has 530 individuals. So imagine in one whole year, the population would be wiped out. Uh, what about the fins? So same, they are rarely targeted specifically, taken opportunistically, and still the fin is the most valuable part of the, of the shark, sold for 20,000 US dollars, for example, could be used for shark fin soup also. It's more ordered as a sign of, of wealth, respect to show generosity to esteemed guests if there's like any social like gathering. Um, other uses could be for oil to make fish oil supplements as with other sharks, uh, to make leather bags as meat. Um, when whale sharks are captured very close to shore, uh, whale sharks are sometimes uh, sold and it's called tofu meat because apparently it's a very soft uh, skin. But this only takes place when it's very, very close to shore because uh, once the individual is, is dead, the flesh begins to smell a lot of, of ammonia. Um, then specifically in the Maldives, um, and I think in all India too, it was the liver oil which was being used to waterproof the, the boats, as well as specifically not in the Maldives, but in India for shoe polishing too, it was being sold as a, as a shoe polisher. So luckily, because of all of this, because of all this fishing and, and the reduction in numbers of, of whale sharks, they've been listed in several like protective um, lists which I'll look, we'll look into, into them. So 75% of the global whale shark population occurs in the Indo-Pacific and 25% roughly in the Atlantic. Um, there has been an overall decline of 63% in the Indian Ocean over the last 75 years. And given that the bulk of the population is situated in the Indian Ocean, Indo-Pacific Ocean, then the overall global decline is more than 50%. Therefore, by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, it has been globally assessed as endangered. So this is a severe listing. This was updated in 2016. It is also included in CITES, which is the Convention for the International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, specifically on the Appendix 2. And it's also in the Bonn Convention for the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, included in the appendixes too. Um, so the thing is, whale sharks, because of them being highly mobile, um, this is part of the problem um, in protecting them, specifically in the Maldives. We saw in 2020, we had two individuals which visited three different atolls, but of course, like only one of the atolls has a protected area. Therefore, and this is very in a very very local scales, but there's there's other whale sharks from other areas which visit other countries too and other regions. If, if you've already seen, like the longest distances they they travel. Therefore, if if we protect them in the Maldives, you know, after they grow larger in size and they leave, we don't know what's going to happen to them. 
Um, so what's an option, uh, like one of the options and what of the, yeah, what people at the end are, are trying to value more the, the price of the individual alive and use it for, for sustainable uh, tourism, for example. In 2013, uh, we, we estimated that uh, 78,000 tourists visited uh, specifically South Ari Atoll putting a value of $9.4 million um, to the presence of these animals. But of course, sustainable tourism is a perfect option, but if it's well controlled, we have encounters with more than 30 boats, we have encounters with more than 200 people in the water, so it has to be enforced, the regulation has to be enforced, because if not, then what's the balance of it all? So what are we doing? What we, once we jump in the water, what we're trying to take is a picture of the spot pattern of the whale shark, specifically of the area we're showing here. We take a picture from the left, left and the right side of the whale shark. Therefore, we can know the number of individuals. We can track movements, identify, well, analyze the different uh, growth rates, the health of the individual. It's non-invasive, it's citizen science friendly. So what we did in 2013, we launched the Big Fish Network, which is the citizen science platform. At the same time, we also released an app called uh, World Shark Network, where anyone can really log into this app if you're an iPhone user, <laughs> I, I, um, iOS, and you can have the individual world sharks there. You can see the different locations where they've been sighted. We now have over 140 members in this database. So what we, we call members or contributors is really anyone who is on a frequent basis out in the water. Um, could be a fisherman, could be a dive instructor, could be a snorkel instructor or, or anyone who just has some interest in marine conservation. And what they do is they take a picture of the whale shark and they collect some of the data we collect too. We provide them all the materials they, they would require for this purpose. And then they have a login and they can submit these encounters to us. We can also, we also provide them the database we have as well as the software we use to identify the whale sharks, which is called I3S. These are the numbers of whale shark encounters from the Maldives. And from what you can see, now over 60% of the encounters we are receiving are coming from contributors, which is great. So these would be our encounter sheet, the different um, data we are collecting. So location, time, encounter duration, number of people in the water, number of boats, the behavior of the whale shark, if the code of conduct has been followed, or if it has been breached. Over here, you would have an individual profile of a specific whale shark. We have Fernando, the most seen whale shark in the database. He has been encountered over 300 times since 2008. And over here, we would have the different whale shark uh, guidelines that should be followed. So it's a three meter, four meter distance, no touching, of course, no riding, uh, no obstructing. So try not to swim in front of the whale shark either. And these are some of the posters we use and that we provide to the guides and that we share on social media too. And how do we spot a whale shark? So it's very easy if they are at the surface and it's sunny. You, of course, if you have polarized sunglasses, this is going to be very helpful. So normally you see a, a gray gray patch in the water and that would most likely be a whale shark or a manta ray or or fish <laughs> but most of the times if it's big enough it would be a whale shark over here it's seen very clearly um, so yeah they are observed very very close to the local islands and over here we can see another individual too
Okay, and, and this is the end of the presentation. I hope uh, you enjoyed. <laughs> and if you have any questions, just uh, let me know and I'll try to, to get back to you. <laughs> Clara, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, doing this wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> it was really, really informative. And uh, even though it's the second time for me, I still found it very, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank now, you. Um, how long have, how did, how and where did your journey start with the whale sharks? I know you've been oh. telling us about the Maldives part of it, but you started longer back then, right? Yeah, so, well, me with whale sharks, I specifically joined as a volunteer for two weeks. Um, and then I just traveled back home, like I had my job here at my island. And, and then one day I just received an email from the director and they were offering a position for me to join. So that was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I joined an interview and, and I told my family I'm leaving for a month <laughs> and then I <laughs> took three years <laughs> to come back <laughs> well I did come back of course between between the three years but yeah that's how it all started I had never worked with sharks before that okay and uh, so you you specialize in whale sharks you're a marine biologist I'm I I would say I, I studied environmental sciences, so <laughs> environmental scientists, but still like the general people call us marine biologists, like everyone who's in the water, but I'm, I studied environmental sciences. I see. Okay, let's go to a few of the comments and questions which have been posted. So Sudeem mm -hmm. says, heartbreaking to see the boat collision photos. Thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> okay, then Thank moving you on to Kalpana. Respect for the other organisms, especially the end. Angered one is totally horrible. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. missing a bit there. I don't know yeah, no what worries. you mean, Kalpana. Can, maybe you can repost that, please. Yeah, I guess that it's, it's very sad. Uh, that Tanya says know. it's sad to oh. see them in an endangered list. Venkat, I meant endangered, in not... Uh... I meant endangered animals. Angered. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Sorry. So it was a bit confusing. Yeah, good, great. So Tanya says, uh, sad to see them in endangered list. It's heartbreaking. Yes, very much indeed. It is very sad. Sujita Thomas says, have you noticed any season when the whale shark aggregate in the Maldives? So... Uh, interestingly, Gita, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I can reply to this one. So specifically in Saudari Marine Protected Area, they are seen all year round. It is one of the only places in the world with a year round aggregation. Of course, there are other atolls in the Maldives and some are seasonal aggregations, but in Saudari Marine Protected Area, it is very unique because of that factor, as well as a very high reciting, reciting rate. Okay, and also she asks, have you done any tagging studies there? So yes, tagging was done in the past before I joined the organization, way before that. And um, it was very badly taken, um, I guess, you know, we had all the permits, but this is something to learn from the future. You know, uh, I think it didn't reach the whole audience that we were going to be tagging and, and the purpose of the tagging and why it would be valuable in, in that specific situation. So uh, since then, tagging is banned in the Maldives. No tagging is taken place. People took it very badly. There were, there were different opinions. People thought that we were tagging them to just to know where they were and take guests. Other people thought that we were going to scare the whale sharks away. Others were saying that they were um, very invasive methods for tagging. So ever since then, it's been banned. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rekha Nair is asking, 
Sorry, where did it go? The encounter sheet. Yeah, could you share this encounter sheet with us? Yeah, that's so fine. So that we could also try to use this. Yeah, of course, that would be no problem. Do you have it on your website? Um, no, but I if 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 I could share my email address here, and then if if and if you contact me to my email, sure. I can send it through to that you. Would be useful, yeah. Shark research. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, Enrica here. I think that would be good. Uh, maybe if we could share your email address, mm -hmm. it would be nice because we have a, a good lot of people working. Sujita, myself, we are all working on this, so it's been nice. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I just uh, posted it here. So I know two of my colleagues went to the conference in Goa uh, in 2018, I think it was, but unfortunately I, I, I couldn't join. But I know they were in touch with, with people from, from the team, from Wildlife Trust of India. Oh, okay, thank you. We, we'll get back to you. Mm. But thank you. <laughs> um, then yeah. did you notice any mantas? Do you have there? any jellyfish blooms in your water? There are, but very sporadically. It's not that we, we have big numbers, at least where, where we are based. So normally we are always in the same location. Although we train people from all the you know other areas of the country, specifically jellyfish where we are, no, sometimes there are, but not not that many. And then mantas, there is uh, uh, an organization called Manta Trust. Uh, we collaborate with them very frequently. We just did an expedition with them in February. And yes, so we observe uh, mantas specifically in South Atoll. But there's a very known aggregation site called Hanifaru Bay in Ba Atoll, and that's where they are observed normally between May till September. That would be the high season. And they have like up to 100 and 150 uh, mantas there, as well as whale sharks. So some of the whale sharks from South Ari suddenly visit the area in summer. Well, in summer, sorry, I say summer because it's my summer in Spain. But you know, during that area, they travel to Ba Atoll. To visit the mm -hmm. area and, and feed there. But, but is it true that Hanifaru Bay has been closed now for quite some time? Uh, sorry. Sorry, has Hanifaru has Hanifaru Bay been closed for some time now? Uh, no, it's so uh, they they are they are having encounters currently, so it's open and they have rangers and there's there's mm -hmm. a bit more control over there. As in who enters and the number of people in the water and okay, uh, I don't know if you are aware, Clara, Clara but uh, on the east coast of mm -hmm. India, there have been quite a few sightings of juvenile whale sharks, okay. uh, particularly near Pondicherry in the last three or four years. Okay, and also in other parts of the world, divers have reported much more sightings of whale sharks than normally have been mm -hmm. in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure you know about this. And uh, uh, some of the uh, reason people are saying is because of climate change, mm -hmm. because of shifting climates everywhere, animals which have never been seen in some parts are now being seen. So what is mm -hmm. your opinion on that? Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's there's so many factors which would come into place. Um, but what is evident is that it's male whale sharks mostly seen in coastal areas for different purposes, at least because I know the specifics for South Ari and why they are there, because there's deep waters, there's a very nice shallow reef where they can thermoregulate. But specifically in Gujarat, I don't know the conditions, like how, how is, you know, the depths or, or the food availability. In other areas, there's... there's Gujarat is very, very shallow. Very shallow. Yeah, then it could, they could be using it as a safe heaven, as a protected place. As in as in Sampa, in South Ari Marine Protected Area, where they, they tend to feed deep, but then come up quickly and, and stay in the shallow waters, feed deep and come up again. But yeah, then female whale sharks, it's very so rare to see them and in coastal areas, I think in the Red Sea, there's a 50-50 ratio, I would have to check, but it's males and females. 
but then the rest of the sites it's all uh, mature females um, like St. Helena there's near the coast there's 50% females 50% males and then Galapagos it's females but where are the immature females we don't know it's very very interesting mm -hmm. we have a couple which visit Saudari but then the mm -hmm. reciting rates are very very low yeah Very strange. There's so many things which we still don't know about whale sharks, and that's really frustrating because where they give birth, where they mate, it's all a big question mark even now, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I saw Re Reka. She just uh, just asked, has this okay. work been published? So I can, uh, if you send me an email, I can yes. send you through some of the papers we've released, and I can send them directly to to you. Yeah, please send yeah. Uh, on Thank the postal you. impact as well, please. Thank on, you. On our email ID. The... Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you my email ID. You uh, can S kindly S share the paper. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, SSA is asking, why are they cited in large numbers near Diu in Gujarat? Yeah, th this is specifically what I was, uh, rep uh, this is the what message I had seen. I, I don't know what yeah, the talking about earlier, yeah. yeah, I don't know what the specific conditions are there. I would have to like investigate further. Um, yeah, to understand why would would they be cited there? I, I don't know. I'm assuming it's the, ma the, the immature males, right? Rekha and uh, Sujita can probably tell us a little okay. bit about this because they okay. are working in Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, okay. which does a lot of research into sharks and uh, mm -hmm. fish. Okay. So uh, ladies, if you have any observations on this, can you please share? Anyway, I'm sorry, uh, I missed out the beginning. I couldn't do a proper introduction to you or start the webinar in the normal way that we usually do, but that goes with the territory with online presentations and with the monsoons here, <laughs> uh, which is what we blame for everything, including my lack of uh, expertise in running it. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right. So when are you due back in uh, Maldives, Clara? Do you I have think, any clarity on that yet? I think in November, because I'm trying to, now is the high season in Spain and I, I have to continue with a part-time job here. And then November, perhaps I'll be able to join. Yeah. I mean, we are slowly getting back mm -hmm. uh, in field. Uh, of course, it's it's been there very difficult to everyone, right? So we it hit us hard the the organize the the pandemic. So that's yeah. right. Yeah. As, yeah. As, uh, a smooth start. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And. Uh, if I may ask, where do you get your funding from for the Whale Shark Project? So we have, um, we, I would say we rely mostly on the volunteer program we have. So before COVID, what we used to have is, a, is an annual presence in the Maldives and we were running two week sure. volunteer programs. And uh, so we have the volunteer program, then we have private donors, or if we have funding for a specific project, then we have um, liveaboard companies, which sometimes, um, for example, now there's a specific liveaboard company, which is linked to a travel agency. They have funded us uh, in order to improve the code of conduct package for guides. So that would be one, then specifically a swimwear which has like whale well shark patterns. They have funded the dive master for one of our colleagues, plus has enabled us to get um, to one of the local islands where we had never been in the deep south. So it varies a little. I mean, we're always, you know, <laughs> there <laughs> trying to <laughs> trying to survive. Um, currently during COVID, we had, uh, for example, the University of Edinburgh, we provide uh, opportunities for them so they join us in field this time they were not able to join us so it's a specific master's program so they made a donation to sometimes we have international schools visiting 
So yeah, a bit, a, a bit of all of that. <laughs> so can you uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, citizen science program? What do you charge for it? How long ah. is it for? What does it involve? No, it's it's for free. So uh, the citizen science programs are really anyone who has a whale shark encounter, they they send us the footage. Like imagine it's someone new to the database, someone new as a, as a contributor. They contact us and say, hey, I saw this whale shark. So I get back to them. I offer them this training program. It's, it's very short. It's, of course, there's a lot to read because, you know, you have like to follow the guidelines to, to submit an encounter to a specific website. But I mean, I, I'm doing like this week, I've done three, three courses and it's normally in one afternoon, we, we have it done and it's, it's for free. Like anyone can join. Specifically, it's for the Maldives, for Maldives guides or, or locals, yeah. And we, yeah, we just give them the access to the database and then um, the ID software also. And if they have time, they could do it with their guests at their guest house or at the, the dive boat. But yeah, it's a continuous, like every week we have courses because there's a lot of staff turnover. So perhaps I have 140 contributors, but there's only like 20 which are super active. And the rest, you know, I contact them, hey, we haven't received any data from you. Are you there? And then, oh, I left the country. Oh, then who's working there now? And then I contact this person and, and start all the process over and over again. So, and can India, uh, how Indian can collaborate with this project? I mean, really the thing is that specifically like the citizen science platform is for Maldives, for the Maldives, because we are focused with the Maldives uh, website. I mean, with the with the Maldives citizen science platform and the Maldives uh, database. What I don't know if currently in, in India, you have something similar, if there's a uh, database there, if there's any citizen science initiative there. And if not just spreading the word, like the importance of the species, the importance of of following the guidelines, increasing awareness uh, presentations for, for fishermen or, yeah. <laughs> any, any, any thing like this would, would help, you know, every small step at the end adds on. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm Sujida. Uh, actually, hey, I hello. lost connection in between. <laughs> yeah, now it was very interesting talk. And uh, actually, in uh, I don't know what was the question you had asked earlier because Venkat had asked me to speak. Can Venkat repeat what uh, he wanted me to speak? Yeah, we, we wanted to know what. So, for example, in, in Gujarat, in near view, is it mm -hmm. specifically, uh, do you know if it's uh, juvenile whale sharks? Do you know if, if it's like mature individual uh, what uh, you know no whatever which is landed uh, along the indian coast we have observed that it's all juvenile sharks okay. whale sharks okay yeah that's what we have observed eh? and okay. uh, right now we, we are also doing a lot of awareness programs on whale sharks along the coast and uh, recently in calicut that is in kerala we had okay. uh, some fishermen they got the whale shark and they released it back to the sea so that was one of the very, uh, I mean, the highlight because because of the awareness only they were, they knew that it, it's not to be caught. But uh, at some places uh, still now they are uh, harvesting it, and okay. uh, I mean, I mean they are they are not catching it purposefully. But once it is caught, it will be it is being taken. That is all. I mean, undercover, not like uh, outside. Mm. It's all very strict rules are there for us now. Okay. Especially for all the endangered. Uh, marine species, mm -hmm. strict loops, rules are there and wildlife and uh, fisheries departments are all implementing agencies. So we have rules in place, but of course, anywhere it happens. <laughs> so that yeah. happens here also, mm -hmm. but uh, now people are more aware of it. I, I heard that. So it's something just that I, that I read the, 
So before the the name was called like Barrel and it changed to Valley, which is like dear one. Or yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah, no. yeah. And yeah, and in Gujarat uh, there was a big program for whale sharks, and so many NGOs are also working in there. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, and in Gujarat now there is uh, implementation of uh, protection is uh, proper there because uh, even the fishermen communities have taken up the a cause and they are uh, working a lot for it. Okay, yeah, because I, what I what I read was that when fishermen would catch a whale shark, if they were in for if they informed or if the nets were broken, then the the government was giving them money. Yeah, Is yeah. In Gujarat, they have started like this, it. No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because uh, usually they cut the net and uh, releases the shark, and mm -hmm. that uh, cost is compensated by the government. That okay. is already implemented in Gujarat. So okay. step by step it is coming. So it's very good. Wow. Maybe we will have more interactions later. Yeah, very sure. interesting talks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be nice, yes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And are you are you in touch, for example, with the team from Sri Lanka? Do you Yeah, you... Blue Resources we have, Daniel. Daniel with Blue Resources is there, no? Blue Resources. Blue re ah, okay. So uh, yeah. So Daniel, we are in touch. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel used to come here and we have many, we have prepared some NDF documents and all. So those things are, um, and also Sarah Fowler, she mm -hmm. had come here and okay. uh, we prepared two NDF documents for thresher sharks and uh, for the silky sharks. So and did, you, did you see any match uh, between India and Sri Lanka of whale sharks? Did you happen to? Uh, whale like sharks as such, we have not started, uh, I mean, NDF and all, of course, it's protected now. So NDF is out of question. Uh, yeah. So we have not started, but uh, we are planning for some work in these lines on whale sharks. Okay. Yeah, whale sharks. Okay. So it will be interesting to interact with you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then everyone else who joined the presentation, are you also like working in the marine field or any of you just joined? because you're inter interested in, in, in conservation in general. I'd like to just know like who we have in the, in the meeting. Yeah, one of my colleagues is there, uh, okay. Dr. Eka. So she okay. is uh, working on Mandas. So she has also joined the meeting. Okay, that's lovely. <laughs> hello, Sudeep. <laughs> I see you're just saying hello. <laughs> Uh, since you asked a question, um, just wanted to tell you that I'm not a marine biologist or a, or a scientist of any sort. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a diver who has become passionate about marine conservations. And, and uh, I'm one of, one of the people who also volunteers at Coastal Impact okay. and a good friend of Venkat uh, and so on and so forth. So just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to, to, to educate us. Uh, about so many wonderful and not so wonderful things related to whale sharks. So peace be upon you, peace be upon all of us, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to just let you know, for example, in MDSRP, we are uh, six staff members, but uh, two are currently starting the degree in marine science. Uh, then one of our infield coordinators, she studied costume design, but she's very passionate about marine conservation. So, you know, it's not that we are all purely marine uh, scientists, but I think at the end, the, the passion has driven us, you know, to follow this path. And, you know, I think there's, everyone can bring something to the table and, and yep, <laughs> help ensure that whale sharks will, will get some protection. Hi. Hello again. <laughs> <laughs> you went for a swim? <laughs> I went for to, I went to see the whale sharks. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> so I at least I think Sujita managed to manage to connect back and she yeah, had a exactly, conversation yeah. with you. So I'm looking forward to watching the recorded version to see what you guys have to say to each <laughs> other. Okay. <laughs> right, guys, is there any other questions or uh, any other observations, comments? Because I think we're getting close to an hour now mm -hmm. and uh, running out of time. So unless anybody has anything else to 
offer, I think we will sign off here. Clara, I would love to invite you to come in and visit us. Yeah, in, that would be great. <laughs> and maybe even to see the whale sharks here. Yeah. Uh, have you had any data from the Indian subcontinent about the, I mean, photographs or individual? No. Nothing at all till now. No, for now we only get Maldives database, yeah. Right. Like whale sharks from the area. Okay, no, I'm just uh, uh, curious to know whether there are some individuals from Maldives which actually travel to India. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yes. they do. Yes, that would be nice to see. Like, yeah, because in terms of <laughs> yeah, in terms of migration, it is not that far, right? It is. Ah, it's very close. Yeah, and and you've probably uh, well, I, I mean, maybe some of you are already. Um, there's the there's. Let me just if I find it, I could share it. Uh, I will try and share my screen quickly. I mean, maybe like some of you there are have been the ones doing this uh, study, but I'm just showing. This is from the from the Wildlife Trust of India. Ah oh, yes. And this is when they they tagged this individual in in 2017. Yeah, that was the only tag which actually mm -hmm. uh, they had. I've seen this one before at the yeah. Wheel, Wheel Shark Convention in Ahmedabad, the one you were referring to earlier. Yeah. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. just <laughs> in case yeah, someone hadn't seen it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, Clara, so I, we will sign off now. Thank you so okay. much for yeah, a very thanks interesting to, talk. to all you, 13 of you who joined. Yeah. Uh, I had asked you about the volunteers. I guess you've already answered my question, but the program that you run for volunteers. Mm -hmm. Can you just uh, tell me what that includes and uh, uh, how many days is it for? What does it cost? So it's, it's normally uh, two weeks, a two okay. week uh, volunteer program. But the thing is the cost depends on who we are partnered with. Mm -hmm. For example, now we are with a specific liverboard and the cost price is different to, for example, last year that we were based in a local island. We were partnered with a guest house Mm -hmm. So the cost fluctuates a little depending on where we are. Like so the maybe ideas, I can get in yeah, touch with you yeah, exactly. probably in November yeah, when you're exactly, hopefully yeah. back and yeah. then we can work it out because I'd love to bring a group there and uh, yeah. do a conservation uh, based program. I mean, now. still, I'm still working and don't worry, I've been active since like <laughs> since COVID. I work every day. So if you want to yeah. drop me an email, I'm still here, even though I, I work on other things here on my island. But No, no, I understand I that. But <laughs> I think you will, you will not be in a position to give us a package, right? Because before um, November. Before November, th there are still, I will have to check to see if there's availability for the, for the trips of the okay. summer of, of like, yeah, but no worries. <laughs> yeah. We okay. can continue the conversation. Then we'll connect. We'll connect on email. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all and have a very nice evening. Yeah, and thanks to all the people who visited and stayed with us. Yeah. Despite <laughs> there you go. That's Sudeep. Bye bye. Yeah. See you guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. See you. Bye. See you. <laughs>